um, and I'll also share it on our social media. So yes, and so now we are recording. Um, so just a little background on the Sustainable Industry Roundtable, or SIR. Um, it's a group of forward-thinking business leaders and residents with a focus on sustainability in the business world. It's organized through my department, Dallas Clark County Solid Waste Department in the Recycling Division. This group was started in August 2010 with a partnership through the ACC Environmental Coordinator, the Recycling Division, and Power Partners. Um, part of this is a meeting, um, but it's also an opportunity with us to engage with each other for fully sustainable minded missions. Um, if you're on our email list, there was an email um, that went out uh, and we try to kind of group source waste because um, sometimes it may be hard for you to find a vendor for a waste material that you have, but if we group it together, we might be able to get um, a truck to make it in from Atlanta or wherever to pick it up. Um, so one thing that we've been working on is trying to get some of the plastic strapping that you get on your back boxes. We're looking for um, if a vendor for that um, and to see who all has that and see what kind of quantity we have for that. Also woven plastic bags. Um, we're looking for outlets for that. If you have pallets, we do take those at Charm. Um, broken, wooden, plastic, whatever, we take them all. Uh, there's no charge for that either. Um, so just a reminder for that. Um, so again, just an opportunity. Of course, our department is always available if you have questions about if something can be recycled or not. Um, and with us leading it, we do have a waste reduction um, mindset, but um, we can also connect you with other resources if you're looking for other sustainability measures for uh, reducing energy cost and waste, uh, water, those kind of kinds of things. Um, our meetings are held quarterly. Um, typically, prior to COVID, uh, we would go to a different facility. You would tour it, so you'd get to see and smell and um, hear everything in person. Which unfortunately we can't do all of that um, through Zoom, uh, but. It was nice, we also had breakfast and it was also an opportunity to put a face and meet everybody. Um, but right now we are doing it through Zoom, um, which still I start, uh, I think her presentation would be hard to do because UGA is so huge and there's so many labs um, to be able for us to visit all of those. Um, so Zoom does have it been its benefits, um, but we meet quarterly on the third Thursday um, of every quarter uh, at eight o'clock. Um, and again, the location or host varies. Uh, and so our next meeting is during America Recycles Week, so November 18th. And we have it currently scheduled for community, which is downtown um, in Athens. And we will let you know if that is still gonna be virtual. We'll have to see how our numbers look um, and their comfort level with having um, several people in their store. Um, but community, if you're not familiar with it, is a boutique for sustainable fashion and locally made products. It's clothing label. Community service is created by re redesigning vintage clothing into contemporary fashion. Uh, thereby, it expands the lifespan of the quality garments and keeping them out of the landfill. Um, so we're excited to um, have Sandy share about what all that they do there. And um, again, that will be November 18th. Um, if you're not on our email list, please sign up and that's where you'll get the reminders about meetings um, and any waste reduction measures that we have, any other announcements and just connecting everybody. And you can sign up through our website. Again, that's accgov.com slash SIR, S-I-R. Um, and if you are interested in hosting uh, a meeting and sharing about what your business does um, or anything that you're doing in the community, um, we can even have you know, a different panelist of any sustainability minded people. Um, and if you want to share about what you're doing, just let me know or you can email just our recycle at accgov.com. All right, so on to what we're here for today. Um, so we are here to learn about the UGA Green Labs. Um, they are committed to making research labs at UGA more sustainable and, and efficient by reducing resource use, decreasing waste and implementing best practices and technologies. Research laboratories have a substantial environmental footprint using up to 10 times the resources of a classroom or office and generate an estimated 25 times the waste. Researchers can reduce the environmental and social impact by embracing green lab initiatives. In addition to, in addition to improving research processes, participants also benefit from life, prolonging the life of research equipment, better protecting research samples, and experiencing advantages in funding their research. 
This program was created by scientists for scientists to improve upon their research standards at UGA. Um, and their website is greenlabs.uga.edu. Um, and I will point out that they were a recipient of our 2017 uh, Waste Reduction Award from the Recycling Division that we present through our um, Green Fest Awards. Um, and then I will introduce Ms. Star Scott. Um, she's the program coordinator for this wonderful program that we're very excited to share with you. Uh, with a background in wildlife biology and ecology, Star Scott spent nearly a decade as a research professional in conservation-driven research at the University of Georgia prior to joining the Office of Research Safety as a chemical safety specialist. During this time, she developed and advocated for a Green Labs program at UGA. In 2016, the program was created with STAR as the Green Labs Program Coordinator. She is passionate about conservation, sustainability, and research. She is a member of the International Institute for Sustainable Laboratories, Laboratory Waste Landfill Diversion Working Group, the, I can't read what that says, ISLR, let's see, my font is terrible, um, University Alliance Group, the Campus Safety, Health, and Environmental Management Association, Environmental and Sustainability Community of Practice, and the Bringing Efficiency to Research Grants Working Group. Um, STAR is the CSHEMA representative for the Higher Education Association Sustainability Consortium, as well as the co-vice president and a founding member of the Georgia chapter of the in International Institute for Sustainable Laboratories. So she has a little bit of an experience. <laughs> um, so I am happy um, to turn this over to STAR. Um, and again, feel free to chat any questions um, and we'll see what all they got going on at UGA. Thank you so much, Star, for joining us. Thank you so much for having us. Um, let me ask, can you guys, are you seeing a slide that says UGA Green Labs program? All right, awesome, very good. Okay, so um, thanks so much for having us. Thanks for that introduction. Um, I uh, appreciate ACC Solid Waste and Recycling, Sustainable Industry Roundtable, and um, specifically the invitation from you, Denise. Happy to be here today and I um, appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody. Just to let you know what we're gonna do today, I'm gonna give you about maybe a 30 minute presentation. I have had some coffee, so it might actually only be 25 minutes, um, but I'm gonna give you a short presentation and then we'll have plenty of time afterwards for discussion and questions. Um, happy to see a lot of folks I know on the call and thanks for coming y'all. Um, so today is just going to be an overview of our program. What, what is the UGA Green Labs program? Why is it needed? Um, what do some of our initiatives look like? Who are some of our partners? And hopefully I'm going to leave you with some good resources and ideas on how to implement this um, in other places in, in your organization or elsewhere. Uh, just to get us going, I just wanted to take a moment um, to honor the indigenous nations of the Cherokee and Muscogee Creek on whose ancestral land the University of Georgia is located as well as the city of Athens. So um, I'm participating in this indigenous land acknowledgement today um, to bring awareness to the history of colonialism in our country and um, to honor the original peoples who lived here who were good stewards and caretakers of this beautiful place. So uh, the UGA Green Labs program, we help to honor, um, we hope to honor um, their traditions and legacy by also being good stewards of the resources here in our community and um, also hope to foster our community. If you're not familiar with this practice of land acknowledgements, go to this website here, native-land.ca. You can learn a whole lot more about land acknowledgements, why they matter, and um, it's just really fun to look around and see all the um, different locations and their indigenous peoples. All right, so what are green labs? All right, here we go. So here's what my friends think they are, what my mom thinks they are, what safety professionals think they are and what they really are. And this, by the way, is our um, UGA Science Learning Center. All right, so Green Labs program. Um, Green Labs are labs that participate in a program that implements sustainable practices and technologies in research facilities without compromising the quality of research. So usually we're focusing on 
water reduction, energy use reduction, um, waste generation reduction of both hazardous and non-hazardous waste. Um, Green Labs programs, they're far reaching and they impact a lot of things about an organization. Everything from, of course, our environmental impact, safety is a huge one, um, the organizational culture, our lab cultures, uh, the overall sustainability of an institution, equity, both within and outside of a lab, um, purchasing and procurement, waste streams, they have the ability to deeply impact a research institution at many levels. Um, but more than anything, they approve upon what it means to do good science, right? Okay, so what does it mean to do good science? Well, it used to mean that, um, that your work was highly reproducible and that you were hopefully bringing in some grant money. Um, and those things are still very much true, but also um, Green Labs help us to improve upon the process. So like the actual operations of our research and elevate our research to be more responsible, reduce our negative impacts and our burdens um, on the environment and other communities. And also um, it elevates the integrity of our research efforts. All right, so why do we need them? Um, sorry, y'all, I have a frog in my throat this morning. So if you see me mute and do a little silent cough, that's it. All right, so why do we need them? Um, so research labs use around 10 times the resources of an office or a classroom, and they're generating around 25 times the waste. These are actually um, conservative numbers. Uh, UGA has about 1,900 research labs on our main campus alone. We've got over 90,000 chemicals on our main campus, uh, close to 200,000 different chemical containers, and we generate about 62,000 pounds of hazardous waste annually. Okay, I'm not sure why all these things are coming in one at a time, but let me just load it all in. Okay, so. What does water use in labs look like? All right, well, we have, I'm sure you guys recognize some of this. We have the autoclave, we have the rotovap. app. Um, hopefully you're not seeing sink aspirators on campus, but they are still out there. Um, and then hand dishwashing. I feel bad. I'm pretty sure this has got to be an undergraduate somewhere um, who hates their life right now. And that's only funny for those of us who have worked in labs as undergrads. But um, if we just like look at the water use in labs and pull out just kind of one of these to paint an example um, of, or paint a picture of like why water saving is needed in labs, let's look at the autoclave. So if you're not familiar with this piece of equipment, it's a steam sterilizer, it's used for lab equipment, consumables, buffers, waste, and more. Um, so it sterilizes these materials and these units use a tremendous volume of water, both in the operation of the unit and an a cooling capacity. So, all right, a single cycle is using about 90 gallons of water. Um, traditional cooling is adding about 1500 gallons of water per day. Uh, standard gravity autoclave is using about half a million gallons of water per year. You guys, this is potable water. This is the same water that we, we would be drinking. Um, and this is equivalent to um, the amount of water used by four and a half American households. That's one unit, all right? Um, at last count, we had about 100 and close to 130 on campus, on our campus. Um, and here's what happens is that in many cases, in most cases, they continuously run cold water down the drain um, to offset the discharge of the hot water. So we all know it can't, we can't have water that is above 140 degrees going down that drain. And so in order to prevent that, we just continuously run cold water down the drain 24 seven, 365. Okay, so what is the way to reduce this? Water misers, which are solenoid valves. You've probably um, heard them called, I mean, they're called water saving kits, but basically we've added those to all of our campus autoclaves. I know Tyler Alson's on this call and he is my partner in crime on this initiative. So shout out to you, Tyler. Um, but basically these water misers or solenoid valves are added to these units. And so basically um, it prevents that water, the cooling water from going down the drain 24 7, 365, which is great, but they don't last forever. 
They have a lifespan of about five to six years. And when they fail, they fail open, which means we're back again to this 24 seven, 365 cold water being pushed down the drain. Okay, so it's of utmost importance that all of our autoclave users are trained in identifying what it sounds like when one of these valves fails. Um, and that is, and, and so we ask them to report it basically. And if they hear gurgling at the drain of the unit of the sterilization, sterilization cycle when um, it's not running, that likely means the water miser has failed and needs to be replaced. All right. So here are some of the stickers that we put up to, all right. Here's some of the stickers that we put up here. It says, did you know a failed solenoid valve in an autoclave can waste 2.6 million gallons of water a year? If you hear this sound, give us a shout out and we will respond. Now we put these stickers there. For those of you who work in a lab, you know that you probably are walking back to the autoclave about the time your cycle is done. And so you may have a minute or two that you're standing in front of that autoclave waiting for it to be finished. And this is when we're hoping that people are gonna read the sticker that we've put up. The very first week that we put these up, we found two failed valves on campus and the potential water savings of just those two units was equal to the um, annual water usage of 47 US households. So these, these units use a lot of water. All right, energy consumption in labs. So here are some examples of, oops, of energy consuming equipment you're gonna find in labs. Definitely this ultra low freezer here on your left, sometimes might call a minus 80. Water baths, bench top centrifuges, um, we have a PCR machine. And then on the back right is of course a fume hood. Now fume hoods, we're just gonna look at a little bit closer. Um, if you're not familiar with this equipment, these units protect users from harmful vapors by taking out um, conditioned air out of the room. And so it ventilates lit air out of the lab and it's a great engineering control that keep vapors out of your breathing zone. So she's working in this, this fume hood right now and none of those vapors of what she's working with are able to come out into that room because it's constantly sucking air out of this equipment and out of stack out the top of the building. Now you can work with these um, vapors it keeps you safe. It's great. They're amazing, but they're so amazing that in three minutes, this fume hood is going to remove enough conditioned air out of this room um, to fill an Olympic sized swimming pool. So that is a lot of air that it's removing. And think about what went into that air. We removed the humidity out of it. We can, you know, it was conditioned. It was either the temperature was either elevated or reduced. And then it came into the room and then like that, it's back out, it's gone out the roof. So um, in a single year, a fume hood, a single fume hood is gonna use as much energy as three and a half American households. Um, and we have about 900 of them on campus, presumably more um, and certainly we'll have more once our STEM buildings are online. So these are top energy consumers for laboratories. All right, so one way of reducing the energy usage of laboratory fume hoods is to launch a shut the sash program. These stickers that this is John DeRosa, he was our original Green Labs intern. We got these stickers um, from, they were actually designed at UC Davis. Um, and basically what they do is they encourage, and you can kind of see it here right there, they encourage users to pull that sash down if it's not in use. And it just helps people get in a good habit of doing this. So for variable air volume fume hoods, just pulling that sash down is going to save 40% the energy. Um, and it's also going to improve the safety of the person, of the people working in that space. All right, so another big energy consumer on that um, first slide I showed you are ultra low freezers. Sometimes they're called minus 80s. All right, so these units are critical equipment for the care and storage of our research samples. They um, use about the same amount of energy in a day as an American household does. So they are high energy users. Um, just temperature tuning this, right? So this is a term that means you're gonna raise the temperature from minus 80 to minus 70. Just doing that is gonna reduce your energy consumption by 30 to 40%. 
And the interesting part of this is that most of these units, actually most of your samples don't require minus 80. Um, so, okay. All right, so basically how did this happen? All right, it wasn't science driven. It, there wasn't a need for samples to be stored colder. What happened was that the refrigeration industry realized um, that they could actually make a colder freezer. It used to be minus 68 was the coldest. And so the, re the refrigeration industry figured out how to make a colder freezer and started marketing that. When scientists had their seed money and were buying equipment for their labs, um, they went and they said, oh, well, if minus 68 was good, minus 80 must be better. And that, you know, that makes sense, I guess. But also they weren't thinking about the energy bill. They weren't thinking about the energy use um, side of that. And I'm gonna get back to that a little bit later, but um, this practice of raising your temperature from minus 80 to minus 70 is done by CU Boulder, UC Davis, Harvard, Dartmouth, Duke, UC Santa Barbara, AstraZeneca, Genetech, CDC. Um, it is becoming and continues to be an industry standard. All right, so I'm gonna switch directions for just a second um, and take a look at some of the waste that's leaving our research labs. So certainly hazardous waste is leaving our research labs. Lots of EPS foam or styrofoam coolers cardboard boxes, ice packs, lots of ice packs. I see Clayton's raising his hand. Clayton, you, you wanna jump in with a question? Yeah, Star, thank you. My question is when you talk about those standards for the sub 80 freezers, who's setting that standard on campus? Is that like the research enterprise? Yeah, so the researchers themselves get to make that choice. And um, this is part of why we really need to give this information to the researchers. There um, is a tremendous body of research at this point um, that's housed online that has almost any sample that you could think of listed and demonstrating how it's, why it's safe to store at a warmer temperature and who has done it and for how long. And so this kind of information is really important for our researchers to see so they can also feel comfortable because each one of those little samples could represent years. I mean, literally years of their life, but good question. Okay, so um, ice packs. We see a lot of ice packs coming on campus. Um, let's see here, what else? Oh, pipette tips and pipette tip boxes. These are all, by the way, high-grade polypropylene. Uh, falcon tubes and more pipette tips, um, plastic film that's wrapped over everything to demonstrate the sterility. So um, how much waste are we generating? Well, we don't actually know is the answer. For plastic waste, we do have some estimates or being at all said in 2015 in nature that the um, like bioscientific industry was generating 5.5 million metric tons of waste per year. That was equivalent to 67 cruise ships worth of plastic waste. That didn't even include biopharma. And we also know that our use of single use plastics has almost doubled in that amount of time. So it is likely much, much higher. Um, so what is UGA doing to help offset the waste leaving our research labs? Whoop, what happened? All right. Sorry, there's a, a, some strange latency that's happening on my side. So if you see things bouncing around, that's why. Um, all right, well, we're gonna take a look at some of the, the waste leaving our labs and, and we're gonna start with hazardous waste. So for hazardous waste, um, green chemistry is the initiative that we have to speak to reducing hazardous waste on our campus. Um, green chemistry, if you're not familiar with this concept, basically, you are just replacing a more hazardous chemical with a less hazardous chemical um, to improve safety in the lab and to reduce the amount of hazardous waste that you're gonna be generating. So this is an incredible administrative control, but it also empowers researchers to better evaluate their own risk. So it kind of allows them to take some of that risk into their own hands and say, oh, well, I'd like to reduce my risk in this capacity. And it gives them options on how to do that. It also upholds our OSHA, um, lab chemical hygiene plan, CFR 1910. Um, 
Okay, so the dozen, the Millipore Sigma Dozen 2.0 tool is a phenomenal tool. And they actually administer this tool in conjunction with Beyond Benign, who is a nonprofit geared towards spreading the word of green chemistry. Um, I just also wanna point out, like these are things that are on our website. Also, if you go to the homepage of our website, you will see an article that we published last year in the Journal of Chemical Education that shares insights into improving the culture of safety at an institution via green chemistry. So it also explores this Millipore Sigma Dozen 2.0 tool and kind of talks about how scientists can use that in their spaces. So if we look at some other waste streams leaving our labs, oh, that's funny. Okay, so if we look at other waste streams leaving our labs, we've got, oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry, y'all. I'm not sure why everything is loading in one at a time. Everything somehow got automated. I did not do that. So. Um, I also wanted to mention MIT's Green Wizards, um, Green Alternatives Wizard. So that is a website you can go on there. You can say, this is the protocol I'm normally doing. And you can type in a chemical and it will give you a chemical to use in its place that has the same efficacy for the protocol that you're following. All right. So when we look at um, non-hazardous waste in our labs, we're currently piloting several lab recycling programs for lab plastics in conjunction with Joe Dunlop um, and his team at ACC um, in the Center for Hard to Recycle Materials. I know Lily's on this call. Um, I'm not, I can't see faces in this at the same time, but um, she and her lab are, okay, there's your face. Hi, Lily. Um, so yeah, so she and her lab are part of one of the pilots that we are doing to look at lab recycling. And specifically the pilot that she's participating in are is recycling for small lab plastics. Um, so all of these materials that I have listed here are lab plastics, plastic film, expanded polystyrene, um, cardboard, PLA scraps from 3D printers, gloves, animal bedding. So um, all of these have different considerations, right? And so for our lab plastics, the main thing that we have to consider is avoiding EPA RICRA issues. So any sort of hazardous waste concerns um, for any materials that might've come in contact with chemicals um, or previously been in contact with chemicals. So lab recycling is by far our number one request from researchers. And it's something that we're actively pursuing. We are only offering it through our pilots right now and we're really trying because our research community really wants this. It's important for them. And so it's also very important for us. Um, we are currently recovering plastic film and EPS foam, which is also known as styrofoam. And that goes to the charm. Both of those programs were set up by our Office of Sustainability. I think Jason's on the call. So shout out to you for that. Um, and then we're also composting now our PLA scraps from our 3D printers and our campus maker spaces. And we're super excited about that. We are also still composting some of our animal bedding from our vivaria. It was more robust previously. We've had a, a little bit of a hiccup in that program, but we do have places on campus where that's still functioning. And these two photos that are on this picture, one um, are the windrows at our center, um, at our um, conversion center, bioconversion center. And that is where the animal bedding eventually ends up in these wind rows, and then it goes back to our award-winning landscaping. So pretty cool um, how we can kind of, that's a closed loop right there. All right, I also just wanted to quickly mention that uh, we did a lab specific waste audit in 2018, just trying to figure out like kind of what is the deal about that? There aren't a lot of lab specific waste audits out there. I think at that time when we did this lit review, we found two and that's not many. Um, but what we found, and this is Ken McDaniel, shout out to him, he's on the call as well. Uh, and he is incredibly good at waste audits. Sorry to share that secret with everyone, but um, it's true. Um, but basically what we found is that an estimated 93% of our laboratory waste streams could potentially be affected by either upstream or downstream land for landfill diversion efforts. So meaning that 93% of what we found of, of the waste streams that we were looking at were either avoidable, 
recoverable or compostable. There was only 7% that was gonna be definitely non-recoverable. So that was really great news, right? It seemed like, man, this is, this is low hanging fruit for sustainable action and waste diversion at the University of Georgia, especially looking at how many research labs we have. Um, our low, low estimates for how this could potentially impact our waste streams at UGA was that this is about 300 metric tons of waste per year that we could potentially divert from our landfill. All right, so another, um, or the last waste diversion initiative I just wanted to share with you um, is our lab glass rehoming program. Okay, so we often have researchers who have either discontinued a particular process in their lab, maybe they did it for 20 years and it's done, that project's done, they don't need the equipment, which is usually lab glass or some sort of, um, some sort of material like that. Um, so either they don't need the equipment anymore and they're ready to get rid of it, or sometimes we have researchers leave our campus um, and the entire lab has to be cleaned out. So in these moments, we have a lot of materials. This photo is actually, um, these are all textbooks and the material in these books doesn't change. These are fundamentals of science textbooks that you're looking at loaded in the back of my truck going to the charm. But so what we have here, um, so we first offer these materials in-house. We see if any other researchers want them. And I do need to say, these are all non-barcoded materials, which means um, for UGA, that just means that they're below a certain value, um, cost value. Okay, so we offer these materials in-house first if nobody wants them. We then take them over to um, the charm, to the teacher reuse store and um, basically from there, local teachers can go and they can shop for free and they can get these materials. We're keeping these materials out of the landfill. Our local high schools, which some of which are underfunded, as you guys know, lab glass is very expensive, you guys. Um, and teachers are often unable to lead the curricula that they desire. So this donated equipment actually helps to change that by providing free shopping for them for lab items. And it's kind of serving our future scientists. Um, I do want to say too that I know Abigail's on this call and since she has been over at the teacher reuse store, the organization over there is amazing. So this, some of this equipment in the past kind of sat there for a little while and didn't exactly have a home, but we are steadily partnering and working towards having more of a demand and letting the teachers know, actually there's some science stuff over there too now. Um, I do wanna say all the equipment or supplies, anything that we send over there, all of it is clean, it's not contaminated, it's unbroken, and um, it's offered internally to UGA first. Okay, more of these initiatives, you guys, can be found on our website. I know I keep like selling our website to you, but please go check out our website. It's really awesome. We're super proud of it. All right, so how does the Green Lab program work? I just want to back up for a minute um, away from the specifics and kind of point out some overview concepts. All right, so you can see by the variety of initiatives that I just showed you that we are pursuing, um, that there's a lot of different ways to approach Green Labs programs. Uh, the ultimate would be having this massive budget and going in uh, to invest in retrofits or high efficiency equipment or ventilation assessments and real time air monitoring. I mean, I can get really geeky if you give me a budget, but we can still make a huge difference with a very small budget. And the way that we're going to do that and the way that we do that is by focusing on behavior modifications and creating feedback loops. So, you know, this little um, slide, it says, how are we implementing these initiatives? Well, it can be at design level. So literally it could be part of the built environment community where before a lab is even created, we're thinking of these and sharing how we wanna design these spaces. Our new STEM buildings are gonna have um, chilled beams um, uh, in both the uh, lab and non-lab spaces. So it can be at the design level, but it can also be at the user level. And we're seeing that too, by just sharing with people what some of these initiatives are about and why they're needed. Um, it can be about new equipment and it can also be about a new attitude. So there's something really um, very subjective and very ooey gooey that happens when people start embracing green labs 
um, initiatives. And what that is, is maybe they changed one thing. Maybe they started shutting the fume hood sash when they leave. But then from there, it's almost as though it pulls a string and they start thinking about other things in that space that they can also improve upon. So it starts to kind of snowball and build upon itself. And then, um, you know, the huge focus for us is on education, is, in, is on behavior modification, and also looking at what it takes to motivate someone. And then these initiatives on the right are things that we've talked about. I think the only thing we didn't talk about um, are timers that are at the bottom. These are bench top timers that can be, that are safe um, to, uh, to use with bench top equipment. And basically if you need a water bath, you know, a scientist needs a water bath at the moment that they need it. They don't have time to wait for it to heat up. And it does take a while to heat up a water bath, but you can put timers on that. So it shuts down at 7 p.m. when the last person's leaving and it starts back up at 6 a.m., you know, and so it'll be to temperature by the time anyone needs to use it. All right, so if this, if there's one slide that you get today that you take with you, this is it. All of these programs, you guys, are about creating feedback loops. And what do I mean by that? Research shows that when we become aware that our actions have a negative impact, we begin to self-limit those actions. The other side of this slide is that we know that our end users, our researchers, our brilliant scientists are gonna be the ones that are going to hold solutions to some of these problems. They're the ones who are boots on the ground, engaging in these processes, and they are going to also be able to help us find the solutions that are needed. Feedback loops are so important. Can you guys imagine, um, just curious if you can imagine what, um, what would it be like if we just went through the hot summer we went through and no one got an energy bill? So you just turned your AC, you cranked it down and you never got an energy bill from it. You would probably spend a lot more money than you're spending when you're getting that bill. Well, here is kind of the um, paradox for our researchers. Our researchers do not get a monthly bill. They do not see any utility information for their quarterly monthly usage. Um, all of that is handled by Tyler, who's on the call. <laughs> But that comes out of their FNA, right? So that comes that comes off the top of their grants. And so they are paying for it to a degree. They're, you know, they're paying towards it, but they're never getting these feedback loops. And most of the time when we share this information with researchers about how much um, water an autoclave uses or how much energy a um, ultra low freezer uses, researchers are blown away. They do not know this information. And it's not their job, right? It's not their job because they're so highly focused on whatever cell or system or whatever it is that they specialize in. They probably know more about that system than anyone else in the world. So when they go to buy a freezer, they just need to buy a freezer and get back to work, basically. Um, so creating these feedback loops, letting them know what's happening. This is our most precious, um, I guess, opportunity for these programs. All right, and I just wanted to make a, you know, kind of comment about looking upstream and how important this is. I think kind of the history of sustainability um, has been kind of this concept of, um, you know, how can we figure out how to recycle these kind of hard to recycle end products, or how can we figure out how to solve um, these challenges, you know, kind of on the back end of things. We are gonna make a lot more headway looking upstream, y'all. So this is about um, policy change. This is about sustainable procurement. Um, this is about um, kind of looking upstream. Can we engineer out some of the waste streams that I just showed y'all before they ever get to our campus? Well, that's what our hope is because it's gonna be a lot easier to get them um, basically engineered out before they ever arrive, right? Then dealing with each styrofoam cooler leaving a lab space. So if we can create a sustainable procurement initiative 
that um, says we no longer accept these on campus, um, that actually would help us much more than having to process each cooler at the end. And just full disclosure that that's not currently happening. That is my daydream. Um, and other institutions have done that. And so our scientific suppliers, they actually do have cardboard coolers. And there are some really great models out there of higher ed institutions, R1 research institutions, who have said, we're not going to allow styrofoam coolers on our campus anymore. And, um, and so, sorry, we can't do business with you. And then the manufacturers were like, but wait, we have this cooler ready for you and we'll just use it for you. So there's a lot of ways that we can kind of approach this on a policy level that make larger, more lasting impacts, all right? I also wanna say, you know, we work with the International Institute for Sustainable Laboratories. Um, this organization, it used to be called Labs 21. It's the oldest lab sustainability organization in the world. Um, it's an incredible organization. If you are part of UGA, and I do see a lot of UGA folks on the call, even our engineering, um, I think Eric's on the call too. Thanks for joining. Everyone at UGA, y'all, we have a group membership. So you are a member of the International Institute for Sustainable Laboratories, and you get those member benefits. For those of y'all who are on the call who are not part of UGA, we still have a local chapter that you can join for free. It's open to all, and we would love to have you join us. I also wanna just say our annual conference just happens to be in Atlanta this fall um, at the end of September. And if you are looking to run a sustainable laboratory or a green labs program to oversee many sustainable laboratories, come to this conference. It is basically the mothership of green labs. Um, and then some of the national working groups were part of the I2SL Laboratory Waste Landfill Diversion Group, the University Alliance Group, and the Better Grants Group. That's an acronym for bringing efficiency to research. I'm not going to go into that today, but if anyone wants to know more about that, I'm happy to share that with you so you can just reach out. Let's talk about the benefits. Well, for me and my biggest priority, we're protecting the planet and her people, right? Um, it saves money, safety, improves safety. Uh, it helps fulfill sustainability initiatives um, and goals. Uh, it can help you win awards or grants. There's so many reasons, you guys, to engage in green labs, to engage in research sustainability. I think a lot of private industry colleagues of mine, they're focusing on you know, two parts of this. One is the saving money part of that because it helps their bottom line. And the second part of that is that um, it is a good business practice. Uh, people like when you are helping the planet and they wanna support that. Okay, um, I also wanna say, so here are some of our partners and just resources to share with y'all. Certainly the Charm, I know everyone on the call is probably familiar with Charm, Teacher Restore. Beyond Benign was the green chemistry nonprofit I was talking about. I2SL we've talked about. Better Grants is basically about how to bring your sustainable action from your research lab onto your grant submissions and basically how to get a leg up on your grant submissions because you are practicing your research in a sustainable manner. Um, and then My Green Lab, which is a a uh, nonprofit geared towards helping individuals um, green their research spaces. And then of course us, uh, we're on there too. We wanna be your partner and a resource for you. I also just wanna take a minute and say, UGA, um, we had a, a Green Labs task force is how our Green Labs program came about. Now this was a task force that was comprised of about a dozen UGA professionals faculty and staff, and I think we have one student on there too. And we created an incredible report to help justify the need for our program and to share that with our administration to um, ultimately get our program, which is how we got it. This document, even though it's a little, it's a, it's a few years old at this point, it is still so valuable. We have shared this document widely with the national um, and actual international Green Labs community. 
And we know of six different programs at this point that have gotten their Green Labs program by using our template to create their own report. Um, if anyone wants this report, it is on our website. Also, you can reach out and I'm happy to share with you how these other groups used our document um, to create their own document. So if there's anything you know, that we've done that can help you, we want to help you. This is really important stuff. And that's it for me. Um, any questions, we can talk about everything. I'm just uh, grateful for your time today and uh, hopefully you learned something. So if anybody has any questions, just unmute yourself and jump on in or comments. Thanks, Tyler. I wanted to give anyone else from outside UGA a chance, but it doesn't sound like uh, anybody has a question yet. So um, I was thinking about the feedback loop um, idea that you have that you presented and um, something we've done or facilitated with housing was uh, to develop like a water bill, a mock water bill or a mock energy bill for uh, student uh, residents and uh, just to give them an idea of like what it costs them uh, or what it would cost them if they had to pay their, their bills and um, same idea. But, uh, in lieu of actually implementing energy and water bills for for individual labs which is my dream but will be very difficult to do if not impossible not from just a technical standpoint but from a political standpoint um is there or would you consider maybe a student project to develop a laboratory footprint calculator that could incorporate like if you like how many minus 80s you have what temperatures are they at and like you know it could be fairly high level or it could get really down into the weeds of like how many undergraduates do you typically employ and, and things like that and um, what kind of science do you do and you, you know this is not stuff i really know but um you know there would be a way to get you know at least to give people an idea of what their global impact is by by doing science i guess in, in a laboratory yeah, Jason, that is so, um, that's the nail on the head for um, where a lot of the um, kind of platforms, there's a few main Green Labs platforms that are out there in the world, and that is exactly what they provide is this kind of mock um, bill or this, you know, feedback, and they can type in, um, not only can they type in about what type of equipment it is, but they can even type in the age of it. And I think that there's some assumptions made from that. We know like the newer equipment's gonna be more energy efficient. Some of these older ultra lows are pulling um, a lot, you know, four times what the newer ones are pulling. So you are, you are right on the money there for that. Um, I would absolutely, let's chat more about that. I'd love your input on that. I know you're kind of the king of data and numbers. So maybe you can help us um, with that side of things, that would be awesome. Thank you. Hey, Star, this is uh, Kevin Kershey. Great presentation. Sorry, I joined a little late, but glad that I caught uh, almost everything, I believe. Um, you talked about really the, the need and benefits of behavior modification. Um, and I think all of us kind of live in that world and you know understand the benefit, but also the challenges. And I guess one of my questions, um, where do you see some of your bigger challenges? Is it getting you know, lab users, PIs um, interested and, and willing to adopt, or is it getting the kind of necessary foundational operational support? Because we're you're trying to get both sides, you know, of that lab to adopt these behaviors or, or provide the support needed to practice those behaviors. Um, I don't know. Can you talk a little bit about like some of the struggles, challenges on either side of that equation? For sure. And and thank you. That's a, a very poignant question. Um, currently, uh, it is the latter part of that. So the operational side and making sure that we have the infrastructure in place um, with which to support our researchers. 
So, you know, one thing, and I don't know if this is just for the research community or if this is training people in general. I know you and the ACC folks on the call probably have an insight into this, but we basically have one toy, we have one chance, right? So we really need to, when we share a protocol with our researchers, it needs to be functional. And we need to make sure that we have that infrastructure in place to fully support it, long-term support it. Um, it's interesting because in research labs, you know, you could, if we go back to try to retrain and say, oh, our first thing didn't really work, we need to retrain. Everyone has in their mind that first protocol that we taught them. And I don't know why, but it's always there forever. <laughs> and it's like, that was, that was kind of the one shot. Um, so right now, and I, I think, you know, um, some of y'all on the call were in the waste diversion group together. So you know that a lot of this is about making sure we have the support needed from the institution to carry out these programs. We have researchers like Lily's team, sorry to keep calling you out, Lily, but I'm super proud of you guys, who are actually, you know, they drive their recycling from their research lab. This is um, Ron Orlando's lab. They drive it in their personal cars to the charm because that's how committed they are to recovering this waste, keeping it out of the landfill and, and doing sustainable research. So that is something that I would really wanna see change. You know, I wanna be giving that, I want us, us to be giving that as a service to her lab and to all the researchers on campus and making sure it's fully supported. The behavior modification part of this, I think is pretty simple because it's, you know, we're talking about a really highly educated group of individuals. And so usually when they hear what the reality of their processes are, they are ready for change. You know, they're ready. They want to know what the solution is. A lot of times we're not even finished telling them kind of how it works before they're ready. Just like give us what the answer is. So I think that we have really hungry, bright researchers who are ready for this information. I will also say that our, our newer researchers are kind of our easier cells, if you will. Um, you know, we have some researchers on campus who have been doing the same processes for 40, 45 years. Um, they're not likely to really want to change too much at this point, but um, there's great value in making sure that our students and our, our researchers are trained <clears throat> in this. And they share that, you know, They'll share that. And the researchers coming in, especially researchers from other institutions, um, they're wanting to know where this program is because they're used to having it at a different institution as well. Star, I got a quick comment. Uh, first of all, thanks for the presentation. It's been really good. Fortunately, I get, kept getting dragged out of here for miscellaneous things, but... Um, you know, our approach in engineering, you know, has been, you know, if we really want something, and, and you may have already gone down this road, and for, I apologize if you have, but uh, is to get get it inserted in our standards, you know, our UGA design standards. Uh, that way, you know, it's 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 dealt with when the money is really there. You know, when the project comes out, you know, the, the big capital project, whatever. If we're asking for you know, uh, highly efficient freezers or autoclave, et cetera. It's in the standards. So they just, you know, okay, that's what UGA requires and that's what needs to be funded, um, you know, or at least provide some guidance as, as preferred or, you know, or, you know, hey, if, if you're going to do something different, you need to get it, you need to, you need, you need to get an approval for an exception, you know, something along those lines. Um, so anyway, just just a suggestion. You probably have already been down that road, but I thought I'd throw it out there. So I really appreciate that, Eric. Um, Tyler and I'll be at your office in about five minutes <laughs> to talk about this more. No, that's a fantastic solution. And yes, that is 100% what we need to be doing, especially on our larger lab equipment. So fume hoods and autoclaves, things like that, that are actually going to be part of the building. Um, those are steps that we are working towards, but certainly would love to hear your feedback and insights into um, how to do that more efficiently. That would be great. And, and thanks for coming today too. 
Star, I will uh, share, you know, I, we've broached this subject with the architect's office as well. And some of the difficulty with the standards is separating the construction from the equipment. Or obviously from the research community, they have a stronger say in the specific equipment pieces they want in their spaces where we in facilities can drive the conversation as far as the design and construction standards. That's for, it's not to say we can't do it, but we need to get a little better footing, I think, with the research community to be able to um, engage them maybe a little more forcefully, for lack of a better word, uh, when we have those conversations. I totally agree, Clayton. Um, that's a really good point. Yeah, I also think, um, UGA is so massive, you know, we are, our stakeholders are so spread out that I think, and, and I'm just learning, you know, I'm just learning So take this with a grain of salt, but I really think that maybe our biggest challenge is just making sure that we are having the conversations with the right teams, right, with the right people. So hopefully we're moving towards that. But yeah, you're so, that's a, a really great point. I had one idea, Star, and, and thanks, uh, echo everybody's comments. Great presentation. Um, we've talked parts of this before, but hearing it all together um, has, has made an impact for me anyway. Um, one, one thought I had, you know, so it's there's sort of this, what can we push and where do we make guidance and behavior modifications versus buying more efficient equipment and who, you know, there's, that's a complicated task, as, as I know you know better than anybody. Um, have we thought about something like a rating system? I mean, is that something other schools are doing? You know, I know we do that with our buildings, but if, if what I'm hearing is one of the big challenges is not an unwillingness to act, but an education or awareness thing, um, maybe if we had something like that where we rate individual labs if they're interested, I don't, I don't know, just throwing ideas out there. But. Well, that is a great lab, Tyler. Come to the meeting at 10 a.m. tomorrow that you've already accepted. Mm -hmm and help us move that forward. Um, so yes, yeah, so that is actually something that we are very much wanting. We kind of held off, a lot of um, institutions have an internal rating system and they're great. They're great for that exact purpose of, um, of kind of having those internal feedback loops. But we were kind of holding out to see if there was gonna be an international standard because we thought, man, this is going to be a lot more valuable to our researchers if they can put on their grant that they have an international, um, you know, kind of certification for the level of Green Lab that they are. And so we we're holding out for that. We had heard, you know, a couple of organizations that were working on that. Um, there are actually two now that are kind of competing for that top spot. Um, they're both really incredible programs and we are looking at one of them tomorrow so yeah um hopefully we can do that and so our labs will have the opportunity to be you know a i don't know if this is these are the words we'll use but you know they'll be either a bronze silver or gold green lab and so it'll give the lab if you know they can choose to what level they want to participate and then they can turn around and use that information in their grant applications to hopefully get a leg up on labs that are not conducting their research sustainably. I see we're at 9.03. Any last questions? Thanks for coming, Clayton. Appreciate it. All right, well, thank you so much everyone for coming and sticking around. Feel free to email me or reach out to us in any way. Um, we're excited to share any of the information we had. We had a, a really incredible team help us get to where we're at. And if we can help your team get somewhere quicker um, than we did, we wanna do that. So we're all working towards the same mission here, which is ultimately helping the planet and really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much, Denise and team. Um, thanks, Mason. It was nice to see you too. Uh, thank you, Star. That, that was all amazing information, and y'all are doing amazing stuff. It's impressive to see the impact um, that one program can do across an entire university. Um, I mean, 97% of your waste um, 
could have an alternative than the landfill. That's amazing. Um, and what I loved about this presentation too is yes, it was labs, but there are a lot of elements of it that are across the board for any organization. Um, just being aware of what you're doing <clears throat> and the equipment you're using, like maybe you don't really need, you know, a negative 80 freezer or, you know, closing the hood, you know, I mean, that, you know, shutting the window, you know, saves energy. So um, I hope that other uh, organizations and businesses will look at this presentation. Again, we're going to share it um, and get some valuable ideas from it. Uh, I appreciate you so much and all that you do. All of I love seeing all the UGA people that are here. That's awesome that you can kind of reconnect and you know tie up some more loose ends uh, together. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't include a couple of events that we have upcoming. Um, so I'll just end with that. Uh, we have the Water Festival. So again, this is Sustainable Industry Roundtable. So the Water Festival, we will be at that um, unless things change, um, is on September 11th. We host our annual vulture festival out at the landfill to bring a different light to the landfill because there are some beautiful birds uh, that habitat that area. And we have some great fun activities to learn about the, the bird that not as many people admire as much as our director, Suki Jansen, um, and how it's nature's recycler. And so Vulture Festival, festival is October 9th. And then Rivers Alive, which is um, organized through um, Keep Athens Park County Beautiful, uh, opportunity to help keep our community clean uh, is October 23rd. So we're looking for volunteers to help with that. Um, but thank you everybody. And again, our next meeting, what did I say, November 18th with community. So we'll learn about fashion um, and how we can be more sustainable with that. But thank you all, all so much for joining us and feel free to check out our website, sign up for our email if you're not already on our list. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye everyone.